Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back. We have three major things to discuss that are super critical to the markets around the world right now. The first one has to be this trend line. It stopped every single bull market in its tracks this year, and it may be set to do so again. The second one has to be the VIX. For the first time in a long while, it's gone back underneath 20. This shows us that everybody's feeling great about the world and the bulls are back in control, or are they? So we'll be talking about what happens there. And the last one is the Federal Reserve. It's not just what Jerome Powell said in the last 24 to 48 hours. It's also what the bonds market now expects for yields and rates into 2023 and 2024. So let's discuss all of that now. We've got the charts, we've got the macro data, and of course, hopefully we can bring some clarity to a very unclear situation. Well, welcome back everybody to The Daily Show. We're covering stocks, commodities, and cryptos today, but let's begin with our discussion about stock markets. So first up, the VIX. Of course, we've seen the volatility index drop underneath 20 for the first time in a little while. Each other period this has happened, we've tended to be meeting on that trend line. And of course, this is the critical zone where if bears are going to take control of the markets again, they need to do so in the next couple of percentage points. Yes, when VIX falls underneath 20, we enter into what we call a normalized market. When it's above 20, we technically are in what they would call a bear controlled market. This is going to be important and make sure you follow at FX Evolution over on Twitter as well, because we are posting a whole bunch of these charts now over there as well. So definitely check them out. Let's go and have a look now at the funds rate because this is where things get really interesting. And we've got a chart here that was shared by a member of the community. Thanks so much for sharing that through. And I think it shows us here some great information about the previous expectations for the federal hikes and the federal cuts. So as we go back through the last couple of months, you can see where the changes have been made. Initially, it was expected that we would go to a fairly large rate hike and then we would drop consistently. Then the rates had to go higher due to inflation getting worse. Then again, it had to go even higher to stop inflation, but the cuts were there and they were at a steady pace throughout 2023 and 24. But here's where things change. Take a look at the most recent reading of the rates. Not only are we going to, of course, a very similar level, just underneath 5% is expected to be the Fed terminal rate. That is the final rate that the Federal Reserve will reach before starting to cut. But when they do start to cut, they're going to need to now cut at an incredible rate that is knocking off over 1.5% by pretty much 2024. What's this telling us? Well, it's saying the economy is frankly sick and that the Federal Reserve could potentially be starting to get worried about the zombie companies and, of course, everything else that's under the hood. What it also shows you is why the market's potentially rallying right now. Unfortunately, we've kind of stuffed the system. When we started printing money and we started this quantitative easing all the way back in the early 2000s, you know, I would guess with the Greenspan put would be the, the big one. We started to backstop markets. And what that means is that we've now protected markets in such a way that even the worst news is not necessarily bad news. They always expect the Federal Reserve to bail us out. What this is telling us is that that expectation is there again. So in 2023, if things don't get cut, we're going to be in a problem. And this comes back to our discussion of sticky inflation, which we'll be talking about later on today as we look at the charts. So let's move through the positives and the negatives of markets right now. And the first one I think has to be the positives. All country breadth is up. Take a look at this. We've moved from a negative, a very big negative by the way, all the way into a positive recently. And there's no doubt that this is a, generally speaking, fairly positive sign for markets around the world. While we've sometimes gone sideways after this, it's usually meant the bottom was in, at least in the most relevant recent data. Let's pull some of the data though from back in the day and find out what it means. And I think some of you might feel a little bit less FOMO when you start to look at the stats and start to look at the numbers. During some periods when we got these types of thrusts, they were fake and we actually had one last big rally or big drop off here in terms of capitulation or fear where markets literally moved further down and that was the end. You can see that happening a few times. We also had a lot of sideways markets and that's why we get these statistics of 
50-50% in terms of the next week, two weeks, one month, two months, even up to three months, which were what we would call more of a kangaroo style market with volatility still set to be in there or a more consistent accumulation of the street in this area. So what about some of the biggest times that have, this has happened? Do we ever see significant pullbacks after this? Well, you can see here again, if we take the world index percentage and we're talking about these thrusts and these breadth, then in this case, we do also get some significant losses that can be had throughout this time. So I think at this period, a lot of people are feeling FOMO. They believe they've missed out on the opportunity. I would always say, let's go look at XLK and actually see whether we have missed the opportunity. Most of you like tech stocks out there, so we'll check out them later. But I think we need to put it in perspective. There is a very positive sign here, no doubt. But we also have some big negatives and we'll go through those soon. The first negative is not only where current price is at, but also that we're seeing very similar signs to the previous time we hit these current prices where smart money versus dumb money are doing two different things. Dumb money is kind of feeling the FOMO. Smart money is saying, yeah, I I'm cool with a pullback. Let's get a pullback, potentially even. It's still possible, new lows if things get bad. And there's clearly a sickness still in these economies. So smart money and dumb money have basically inverted. They've crossed each other the wrong way around. And that's not what we want to be doing. Remember this, the whole idea of this indicator is when dumb money are freaking out, we need to be sitting there going, okay, wait a second. Can we see potentially buying when there's blood in the streets, buying when there's fear and taking advantage of that? If we look at seasonality, we know that the start of December historically tends to have a rally in it. So far, so good for that. And by the middle of December, we've dipped. Will that happen again in 2022? Well, this is the stats taken from 50, 60, 70 years of history in the markets. We also know that bad years going into Thanksgiving, especially if they're read into that point, tend to be more of a sideways market action after. At this time of recording, we're up probably about 3 4%. So of course, there's a really good chance that by the end of the year, the returns may not be as favorable as people believe. And then of course, we come into the big one here. If the Federal Reserve is to take advantage of potentially inflation, and we have to expect with China reopening and also the inflation numbers starting to drop off, and we also know that when we see these drop-offs in inflation numbers, they tend to be a proper curve that actually goes down, we may have begun to kill it. The question though, how long will it take to get it to a level between two and 3% that is what the Federal Reserve wants? and whether we still have sticky inflation. We don't know that. We could be in stagflation and not even know it yet. Remember, the last two weeks, what have been the best sectors in the market? Gold, commodities, defensives. This is very important when we go through it. If it doesn't make sense to you, don't worry, we'll make sense of the madness in a few moments. So these are the, the facts that we've got right now. We know that, of course, this market is in a period of time called the Santa Rally or the Christmas Rush. We know that complacency is coming back in and everyone thinks everything's great. We know that China now is most likely on the reopening path, which is great for the supply side and great for inflation. What we don't know is how much damage is being done to the economy. And it's always going to be a very interesting factor when we're discussing whether we should be buying markets right now as investments or just basically trading them, which is what most people have been doing over the last let's say six to eight months. Which one do we choose? Well, this is where picking bottoms is very difficult because markets will rally. And this is just the reasoning why markets rally. Markets will rally like everything's getting better. And then if that turns not to be true and the perfect situation doesn't work, it will go down again. The thing is though, it, that's why it's so hard to pick bottoms as well. Unless you're buying pure fear, which is basically why you want to be looking at VIX indicators. I mean, if we get a VIX at 45 plus, no doubt that's going to be a very fearful capitulating time for markets. Remember this, we've hit 35 a lot of the times and that has just coincided with lows in the market. It's a great time to be looking at markets when you've got high VIX and a great time to be cautious in markets when you've got low VIX like we do now, unless we're in a new bull market. This is why it's hard to pick though. So it's always going to be hard to pick bottoms because it, at the time it doesn't look like there's any positivity. And then as the positivity comes in, we don't actually know whether it's real yet. And that's where we find ourselves right now. Do we know that the economies in this world are not sick? I would argue they're totally sick 
and the Federal Reserve and the rate cuts show that they are incredibly sick. But we also know that the Federal Reserve and other central banks want to cover the market. The Bank of England getting involved in the pension funds, the Credit Suisse situation, most likely I'm sure they'll get involved or maybe even they're secretly buying it without us even knowing. If you're not familiar with Credit Suisse, watch one of the previous videos we've talked about how it's looking quite bad on the charts. So we find ourselves at a VIX under 20, at a trend line that we'll talk about soon, and also at a very similar kind of situation where we argue, of course, amongst each other, whether we've got a Fed pivot, whether we've seen the topping of rates, maybe we have, how sick now is the economy is the question we all have to ask, and whether the Federal Reserve can even cut rates while also killing inflation at the same time. Remember, the big problem with inflation is that if you cut rates too quickly, it goes back up. And that's going to be the, the big juggling point of 2023. So I think really 2023 always comes down to now it's going to be earnings. I could be wrong, but I believe it's an earnings-based market and earnings season is going to be massive throughout the US over the next couple of quarters. Let's talk about yields. Let's have a look here at the yields just in the last 24 hours. We'll go to the two-year yield. You can see it dropped, but it's starting to rise here at the time of recording again. The 10-year sitting at 3.53, so definitely a big drop off here. Remember, that means the inversion between the two-year, which is controlled by the Fed, and the 10-year, which is controlled by the market, because the market dictates the longer end of the leg. This is the most important one, by the way. The US 10-year is saying it's sick. Guys, it is sick. We are massively inverted. We have a 4.3, possibly 5% three-month terminal rate or 4.8 terminal rate. That is where it's going to be next year. So if we show this, just so I guess it'll make more sense, let's actually put it on the chart, US 10Y. And once we put these both on the chart, take a look at this, 1.218. If we put this out to a weekly, you'll notice that we have seen inversion like this before, but it didn't end up very well. So <clears throat> when we have this short date so much higher than the US 10 year, it's a problem. It's showing us that the economy is sick again. Can the Federal Reserve stimulate it in time before the cracks start showing? That's the discussion point of 2023, at least in my opinion. Let's move over to high yield bonds. Again, bonds have started to show some signs of life and high yields in particular are the one that we want to be looking at because if high yields are improving, it's showing us that the market itself is feeling a little bit more positive about taking risk on. High yields certainly are looking better. If we take a look at TLT, which is of course the 20 year treasury yield bond, you can see that that has also taken an uptick recently. Could this be part of a bear market rally with drops? We've seen it before. Again, we can load up the S&P 500 next to it just to kind of clarify what's happened in the past. Now notice this, can you see that when we peaked here and I take a vertical, the treasuries were already declining before the topping of the market. And that happened again over here. We had actually treasuries declining again because of course yields and all these types of things. It's a similar thing with HYG. If you load up that and we have a look at this on the charts and I'm just doing this so that we can get a bit better of a picture looking at the data rather than our opinions. If we take a look at the high here, it happened and it started dropping just before the market started dropping. So what we're looking for now is we're looking for high yields, for corporate grade, for other bonds markets to actually show us that there is a sickness in the economy. Here they came in lockstep with each other. And of course, here we saw in lockstep with each other. So possibly one of these bonds might start dropping. If it does, we need to be paying attention to it because the bonds market tends to be able to smell out issues before the stock market can, because stock markets work on greed and fear, bonds market works on risk. It's really all about risk and yields. Let's go over to Credit Suisse. Of course, this is still a scenario. I guess we can all kind of guess that there's going to be some bailout. Possibly there already is a bailout going on. We don't even know about it. Look at the volume and compared to the old history, look how much volume is going through. But this is still an ongoing concern. We're trading at $3 a stock. Now to put it in perspective, just so we can see where we were during the Great Recession, which is of course the global financial crisis, that was a totally different price. That was over here during 09. Credit default swaps, which we shared on our Twitter, I'll just quickly show everybody that. We'll scroll down here. Here's the credit default swaps. They're at all time highs now. 
much higher than where they were during the GFC, which over here was 250 versus 400. It's still a concern. It's still something that we should be paying a lot of attention to in the markets. But let's move over to where we're at right now at the time of recording. So the first thing is the dollar index did not hold in the last 24 hours. If we pulled up the stats from a little while ago, about two, three weeks ago, we talked about when the dollar index fell so aggressively, it was going to be hard for it to maintain further strength. This is again showing us that the market is going back into risk. If DXY is not the strongest of the currencies, then it is showing risk is back on to a degree in the markets. But it's not over yet. We're still in this zone, although I will say going in without a nice heavy rejection is not ideal. You usually want to see these types of weak candles because they show you really strong demand in these markets. Let's have a look at the two hour chart. Let's check out what happened there. So this is the area that was in focus. We were looking for ideally some form of you know, further bullish action to come through here. It didn't happen and it dropped down. So now if it does start to rally, it's going to have problems with that 105.50. And really to put this in, it's going to need a nice wick on the next candle. Will it happen? Uh, we'll come back and record. We'll come back and have a look at this in the weekend video, I'm sure. Non-farm payrolls take us to the critical level. So it's probably not a surprise we're at this zone. Non-farm pay payrolls, the jobs numbers from the US are going to come out and we find ourselves at critical ahead of that big, big jobs number. And this is usually how markets move. They go to a zone that they can't break by themselves. The news comes out and the news potentially breaks those zones. Do remember non-farm payrolls, is, it has a tendency to go off in one direction and then jump to the next direction. As in it, the first couple of minutes, maybe half an hour, it goes off somewhere else and then it comes, it comes back and goes in the opposite direction. It's well known for doing its fake outs. Gold also at an incredibly critical zone ahead of this jobs number. You can see that previous supply, previous massive level. I've also put here the most traded level for the last two years. So this has just gone through that. This area here is still critical for gold. And I think the decision will be made for it pretty much during the non-farms. Very hard to predict there, but we are at the supply or the resistance zone. Oil's looking a little bit better. Uh, a lot of people are saying that governments around the world are kind of putting a protection put in here. Possibly that's true. We have broken through some things. So our downward trend line here for oil was broken. That signal, of course, bullish pressure. And so far, we've got a series of highs and lows and high, higher highs and higher lows and all of these types of things going on. So there's no reason for us to say that oil, at least on the short term, is not being bought by the market. Again, non-farm payrolls is going to modify this a little bit. And I think the markets, the S&P 500 is probably the easiest place for us to look at these things. Tesla, critical resistance, no doubt, 200, 194. We spoke about this level being that long leg doji having some shorters in it. It's not that they really came in heavily, but we do find it at that resistance. Let's have a look under the hood, check out the two hour and check out maybe even the five minute price action. You can see here it kind of had this big swing between highs and lows. And then we ended up in the middle, just kind of grinding it through. Not too much information coming out from this, but uh, it is at resistance, it is at supply. If it breaks through that 200, we have to expect that rallies will be ensuing and that demand will probably come through. Now, there is one preface of this. If non-farms comes out and then during the market open, we take the 200 and then instantly reject it. So we basically go bang, bang like that. This could be what we call like a swing failure. And this will be a very critical zone to be watching. There's a reason I have an alert here. And there's more, there's more than one way to, of course, trade something like that. Apple not really showing us too much, but it's back and it's kind of filled almost all the gaps. I think it almost got that gap, but not quite this one up here, which is from the close of the previous market to where it opened. So there's still a little bit there. It's not giving us enough information. We know where our critical zones are. And if Apple does fall underneath the 132 in the future, that's probably going to signal major pullbacks through the markets. And that's going to be that worrying point where suddenly we might be seeing an increase in the VIX and everything else will start to look good if you're a bear in these markets. Let's move over to a few other things that are going on right now. Uh, and I think one of them that I want to bring up is that consumer discretionary stocks like Amazon, they're not very healthy. It's showing us that the American consumer, which remember is one third of the US economy, consumerism, services is two thirds, is not really that healthy. Now you might look at this and say, okay, well, I like the price. 
what I'm trying to get at is that a lot of people are feeling FOMO like they've missed out on an opportunity. Let's face it, Amazon is at a critical zone, sure, but it is also still on its lows or very close to those lows. If we take a look at XLK, while it has improved and there's no doubt it's coming back off, it's still quite a lot lower. And I said this to the private community yesterday, it's still quite a lot lower to where it has been. So you don't, I mean, yes, you could make an absolute case here that this is this is accumulating and that this is like an inverse head and shoulders and it's going up more and this is looking quite nice. Yeah, I don't doubt that it's looking okay. It's not doing that same type of just the hysterical rallies that we've seen in the past, where it's just like boom, 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 boom. It does have its ebbs and flows, which is good, but it's still relatively speaking close-ish to its lows. All right, let's now go through the rest. Semiconductors at their resistance, of course, if the market's going to start selling off, this is an important point, and semis should not be breaking that 250 easily. So I'm going to set an alert there for 250 because that's where you've got to start saying, well, wait a second, is this actually a recovery? At this point, eh, maybe we don't have to think that just yet. XLE still looks quite weak, distribution. And remember, that one had that hysterical rally on it. Everyone thought it was so great. We're still in this distribution. We're still seeing weakness every day, and we haven't seen a strong rally in XLE over the last couple of sessions since Jerome spoke. Old economy versus new economy. The new economy is starting to make a comeback. That's good for recoveries. Old economy should not be the one really recovering us. It should be the new economy. It's only still very early in that point, though. XLY versus XLP, again, slightly better. You can see it's slightly better, but still down heavily. And this shows you that as a percentage, most of the market is still in defensive sectors. If you load up something like XLP, look at that. Look at that rally. Does that look healthy? Does that look good? I'm not so sure about that. Let's have a look at utilities starting to show some pretty big signs of recovery. Again, another one of the sectors that's taken us up. Let's look at industrials here. Look at industrials flying. This is not normal. XLK didn't look that good, did it? XLY didn't look that good, did it? And that's because the market's sniffing out a sick American consumer and potentially just a bailout by the Fed, which is going to help more the defensive things. It's like a, a weird pseudo kind of stagflation. That's why gold, that's why commodities have been doing so well uh, because that's the play there. Let's move over to the US 100. Are we out of the woods yet? No, we still had that little supply here. We tapped the high and then we instantly rejected it. So we're still at that resistance. Funnily enough, when we find ourselves at the exact same, very similar resistance for the stock market. And within this next 20 to 40 points is gonna be very, very important for stocks. So what did we see? Well, we saw a high, we obviously saw a low, we saw a higher high, and we saw a lower low and a rally. So it looks like markets are kind of gonna weaken here a little bit. And we'll go over to the S&P 500 just to see that. So first up, I wanna mention, of course, this point here, which is the gap fill. The gap fill, theoretically, if it was to fill to where it closed before that previous, I think it was CPI number, we need to move to 4110. Now, 4110 is a pretty important level. I'm going to load up this chart here, and I'm just gonna say this, we have previous daily closes here. We have previous monthly closes here. We have an unfilled gap sitting here. We have previous supply that sits here or resistance, whichever one you want to say. The trend line that's just before it. So that's where we're selling right now. But imagine if we spiked it, that would freak everybody out. It's definitely a key level. And then on top of this, if we actually get a volume profile and up until this recent little price, and I want to just detail this, up until this recent little price, notice where the most traded zone was. Interesting, interesting, interesting. So right there is where throughout this entire drop was the most traded zone for the market. And I think that's what <laughs> that's pretty interesting. Now, if we move it over to the current price, you'll notice here that uh, they've been building in a, a position through this point. So I think we know where the bears are going to take control. I think we know something about this little this little area. Hopefully we'll have a reaction to it. And we also start to build these defended areas. So that means that if this area here gets broken in the future, especially 3,900, then we've got, to, we've got to basically think that rallies will be met by sell demand. And remember, we have a massive gap fill still at 3,750. So we've got to see the forest from the trees. How do we do that? Well, we basically try to go in here with an open mind to both cases. There's no doubt that breadth looks amazing. There's no doubt that bonds have improved. These are the facts. 
they have. Both of them improved. There's no doubt that the bonds market is also telling us that the Federal Reserve has to cut so many times to potentially protect the economy. And that's where the big changes happen, that back end of 23 into 24. So it's like cut, 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 all the way down. In fact, the prediction could be all the way down to like 1% cuts. That's how sick they're making this economy. But at the same time, we also are at the zone where if bears are going to take control, they need to do it somewhere around in here. And it reminds me a little bit of over this area where, of course, I guess many of you actually did come and view our videos and I was pretty adamant on that zone. Now, I'm as, am I as adamant on this zone? Probably not as much because there's a little bit more bullish case. We've got the China opening. We didn't have that over here. I thought the Fed pivot was a joke there. I still think Fed pivot doesn't mean green market. Remember the last two times or the times feds have pivoted, they pivot because the market's sick, they cut rates, and then usually the market has actually dropped more after that. The question is what kind of support are they putting in the market? We don't know that yet, we can only speculate. So I like to look at it as we sit right now, we are sitting on a key resistance, we have a very key resistance just behind it, and we also have some known kind of support zones. We also know there's a gap fill from the CPI number that is still left. It's like unfinished business on the chart, yeah? So these are the facts that we're looking at and I wanna bring up one other point before we finish today's video. I know it's long, thank you for sticking with us. Let's move over to the S&P for a second here and look at the SPY options. So this week, well, what do you do? I mean, the market is basically sitting at 406. The perfect level for them to close is 400. Funnily enough, we're not that far away from that. And then we've got the 4.15 and we've got this 3.90. But let's skip out a few more weeks. Let's go to the 16th, which is the major options expiration. And I want us to just to look at this number, 5.56 million units. Wow. Take a look at these 4.20, 110, 4.40s, 4.45s, 400s, max pain of 3.89. There's still so many puts in this system but at the same time, remember 375 was where that gap fill is. Isn't it possible that it could do this where it goes down to that level and at least find some buyers? Anywhere in this area seems like a great place for the market to close. The stats point towards kangaroo style. That's what we saw last time when we had these kind of breadth indicators. The market is at a resistance or at least close to so will it rally through this easily? Well, I think this is where start, people start to feel very conflicted statements. And that's why I think it's important to step back and say, well, let's look for the evidence on the technical charts and the fundamentals in general, whatever, and then start to look for it. Now, a lot of people are also looking at things like the Bitcoin. So Bitcoin as a precursor. Well, if you believe the Bitcoin was the precursor of the rally, at the moment, Bitcoin is starting to find some shorting. So again, makes a new low here. I'll set an alert for that, why not? If it does make a new low, that's gonna be relatively significant, about 16,700. It's a key zone for us to look for. Now remember guys, it is all about news and the data or the data dependent Fed is gonna be looking at everything. I think they're clearly freaking out a little bit about how hard they've had to push rates and some of the economic data they're seeing. And I do think economies around the world are sick. I don't know if anyone else disagrees with me. They, they look sick to me. They look very, very sick. We know property's dropping. We know that that hurts most retail traders out there, retail investors and everybody, mums and dads and everyone out there has a lot of property, so it hurts us. And that will mean spending is down. The markets have allocated for that already to a degree. What do we now see in the jobs numbers? Is a historically strong period for the US jobs during, of course, hiring for Christmas, going to weaken. And what does that even mean? Well, this is where we don't want to speculate, but one hour before the market open, we will find out that number. The markets will do their little dance. We're at critical zones for dollar index, gold, and even the stock market. And funnily enough, we're also at a VIX underneath 20. So it all coincides with these big bits of news. This is how the market works. And remember, if you've got a critical bit of news coming up, there's a good guess that the market will be going towards a critical resistance or support or supply or demand right before that bit of news. Thanks so much for watching. Make sure to subscribe if you enjoyed today's video. Share it with your family and friends and whoever else you think might be interested in this. I know it was kind of technical. I just wanted to talk about this concept because it's a, this is kind of the process that you go through and you have to build the weight of evidence. If you're gonna be a long-term investor, 
or even a trader, you have to be aware. Now, this doesn't mean you have to go and watch mainstream media and pay attention to all of those stories. But what you do want to be doing is saying, well, what's the market telling me? Can I therefore build you know, some kind of case for either bullish or bearish action? And you can definitely make a case for both. And that's the beautiful thing about the markets. The question is right now, who's going to be right? Well, we know we're at technically a zone where bears should be lurking. Let's find if they find the salmon. Thanks so much. Bye for now.